the path of homogeneity to the rich assortment of present-day structures be traced? More conventional models assume that individual galaxies arose from nearly homogeneous primordial soup. The main trouble from this model is explaining how the universe proceeded from a smooth state in which matter was gathered into galaxies. All real processes go with an increase of entropy. The entropy also measures the randomness or the lack of orderliness of the system. The greater the randomness, the greater the entropy. The very structure of the universe is determined by these numbers. If any of these numbers were off, it wouldn't exist. For gravity, if the gravitational constant had been added to by these infinitely small increments, the universe would have either infinitely expanded out so rapidly, no stars would form and no life would exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, no life. If the mass and the energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to a precision of 1 part in 10 to the 10th to the 123rd, the universe would have been hostile to life of any kind. Click the link in the description to learn more about fine tuning. Did God create nature? Ask a protein. Proteins are so hard to make that in all of nature they never form except in already living cells. This scientific fact stands in stark contrast to what is taught. Matter can come from nothing by itself. Out of nothing, nothing comes. The laws of science are simply laws of science. They cannot create anything. To think the laws of science can create the universe is like thinking you can create money by doing sums. Laws won't do it for you. Look around. How could all this come from nothing in chance, like life or the feeling of love? If you study the Bible, you'll find the Bible is perfectly accurate throughout history, and looking at old copies have proven it hasn't changed. You would think a woodpecker's head would hurt from banging it on a tree all day. But it doesn't, because he's equipped with special equipment. For instance, between his beak and skull, there is a piece of cartilage which reacts as a shock absorber. His skull is the thickest bone per body weight of any creature, and he has an extra long tongue to catch bugs. Plus, he has a glue factor and solvents to dissolve the glue. The woodpecker's tongue couldn't have come from evolution because they have much different structured tongue than others. Now let's move on to penguins. Males have an egg pouch that keeps the egg alive at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, even through the cold weather of negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and he loses up to 40% of his body weight taking care of that egg. Also, penguins can recognize their mate's call out of thousands of calls. When you look at an egg, it has thousands of tiny holes so that the animal can breathe. Inside, there is an egg sac that only lasts six hours when he's fully developed. Well, it gives him exactly six hours to pick a little hole through the shell. Every single step has to be perfect timing and done exactly right. Another interesting fact is the bombardier beetle makes chemicals that couldn't have come from evolution. Warfare is the bombardier beetle. It can create a chemical reaction within its body so violent that boiling caustic liquid explodes out of its abdomen. By pulsing the jet 500 times a second, it keeps its rear end just cool enough to prevent it being cooked. With the link below, look at more incredible creatures that defy evolution. The Laboratory Apparatus of Stanley Miller If you attempt the experiment using now what scientists believe to be the accurate atmosphere, you don't get amino acids or anything else suggesting that life could develop from the mixture, proving the Miller experiment wrong. The Big Bang is like a typewriter exploding and creating the dictionary. In the beginning, there was an explosion, explained Nobel Prize winning physicist Seven Weinberg in his book, 
which occurred everywhere, filling all spaces from beginning with every particle of matter. The matter, he said, consisted of photons, which make up light. The, the universe, he said, was filled of light. Interesting. That's what the Bible says, too. Darwin said in his Origin of Species, if anything could be demonstrated that a complex origin existed which could not have possibly been numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Therefore, the complex molecular micro-machines that make up cells must have been developed one bit at a time, small step by small step. For instance, using the example of the mousetrap, maybe the first time there was just a platform, which evolved over time into a platform with a spring and so on. But Darwin's theory of natural selection or survival of the fittest says that the systems that work best are the ones that survive and develop further. In a mousetrap that is a flat wooden platform doesn't work, so according to natural selection, it wouldn't develop further. It would become extinct. Like the mousetrap, molecular machines are irreducibly complex. Without all their parts in the right places at the same time, they don't work. Since natural selection chooses systems that are already working, any incomplete molecular machines would bite the evolutionary dust. Also, these micro-machines are too complex for all their parts to have come together all at once by a random process. My conclusion could be summed up in a single word, design. I say, based on science, I believe that complex systems are strong evidence for a purposeful, intentional design by an intelligent agent. No other theory could be, certainly not Darwinism. The presence of such specific information in DNA is a critical issue. If you can't explain where the information comes from, you haven't explained life. Because it is the information that makes the molecules into something that actually functions. In 1871, Charles Darwin wrote a letter in which he speculated that the origin of life may have come from a prebiotic soup. This prebiotic soup is accepted as the origin of life. If this prebiotic soup had existed, it would have been rich in a lot of nitrogen, because amino acids are nitrogenous. So when scientists examine the earliest sediments of the Earth, they should find large deposits of nitrogen enriched minerals, but these deposits have never been located. By the early 1970s, most origin of life scientists were disappointed in the options of random chance and natural selection. As a result, some explored a third possibility, that proteins and DNA could put themselves together. Mayer pointed out that there are huge difficulties with this theory. Remember, he said, that the genetic information in DNA is spelled out by the chemical letters a, G, C, and T. What if there were a force that made an A automatically attract to a G? You just have a repeating sequence of A, G, A, G, A, G, A, G, A, G. In much the same way that a salt crystal is a repetitive sequence of N, A, C, L, over and over. Does that give you a gene that could produce a protein? Is it possible there has been or can be a divine revelation? You cannot limit the possibilities of omnipotence except to produce the logical impossible. Everything else is open to omnipotence. Where do the laws of physics come from? Why is it that we have these laws and not some other set? How is it that we have a set of laws that drives featureless gases to life? Intelligence? I'm not saying there isn't science. I'm just saying that there's an intelligent being that giveth purpose to life behind it. It is mind that composed the physical universe and creatures that know how to create science, art, and technology. The only satisfactory explanation for the origin of such indirected self-replicating life we see on the Earth today is an infinitely intelligent mind. The whole infinite series will have no explanation at all, for there will be no cause of the member of the series lying outside of it. In that case, the existence of the universe over time will be an inexplicable brute fact. There will be an explanation in terms of laws of why, once existent, it continues to exist throughout time. The universe of a complex physical universe Infinite or infinite time is something too big for science to explain. Evolutionists believe several millions of species have gradually evolved during hundreds of millions of years. A vast number of intermediate stages would have arisen throughout fossils, but they haven't. And a number of intermediate stages or transitional forms that would have lived and died would have been billions times billions. If evolution is true, then at least many tens of thousands of quarter of a million fossil species in our museum should consist of unquestionable transitional forms. With all of the sophisticated laboratory equipment we have today, with all of the, we have every kind of chemical you can think of, we have every kind of powerful computer 
So on the campuses where I go, I'll say to the professors that are arguing against creation and for evolution, I'll say, okay, look, you've got those computers, you've got the laboratory equipment, you've got every chemical, mix them up, make it come to life. That's all you have to do. Because evolution assumes that that happened at one time in the past. All right, now, that's, that's, that's probably the first major assumption, that dead things can come to life. Then if reptiles, let's say, became birds, that's what evolution taught me. Reptiles first, then birds. So we have a reptile, cold-blooded, dense bones, that's going to evolve into a bird, warm-blooded, hollow bones. Now, is there any such thing as, let's say, a lukewarm-blooded, semi-dense boned creature that's in between rep reptile and bird? No, no. You either have a reptile or you have a bird. And some, well, what about Archaeopteryx? Oh, leading evolutionary thinkers now are telling us, no, that's a pure bird. That's a pure bird. As a matter of fact, they have birds now that they have found that are before the Archaeop Archaeopteryx. And so, what is evolution then? Well, it's a faith system because it's based on assumptions that even today, the leading evolutionary thinkers of our day, they cannot hook up these vast distances between various types of creatures. Oh, well, you see, those are the transitional forms. With the, now that's the new name for the missing link, you see. It doesn't sound as missing if we call it a transitional form. And so, well, those are the transitional forms. Now, we haven't found them yet, but we will. We will. Give us enough time, we will. Well, what they are finding with the time they have is, and especially now with things like molecular biology, where they can actually go in and look at the molecules. One quick example. Ramapithecus was supposed to be an, an ancestor of man. That was It was assumed to be our ancestor. And then you have Vincent Sarich out there at Berkeley, and, and he uh, does the molecular work, an evolutionist. And he, oh no, Ramapithecus is an ancestor of an orangutan. Well, it's still in some textbook as an ancestor of man. When it's been proven at the molecular level, it has nothing to do with man. The G thesis has several components. First is a contention that the granitic rocks from which samples reportedly came constitute to the primordial crust of the earth. But then these rocks are biotite, an iron form of mica, a fluorite crystal salt which bear a relatively uncommon class of tiny concentrated discoloration halos. These halos were considered to be the result of damage to the crystal structure of the minerals caused by high energy alpha particles. In numerous papers published in scientific journals in the 1970s and 1980s, Gingery built the case that the different alpha decay energies of the various naturally occurring radioactive isotopes of the element polonium. The polonium part of the decay chain of the natural uranium and thorium of the short half-life measured in microseconds to days, depending on the specific isotope. Concentric halos associated with polonium decay, but without any rings corresponding to any other uranium decay series isotopes were taken to be evident that host rock had formed almost instantaneously, so they must have formed in under three minutes or they wouldn't exist. Therefore, that is proof of God. The second law of thermodynamics states that the isolated system can only become less ordered, less organized, less complex. It can never go in the reverse direction. In violation of this natural law, evolutionists believe that the universe is an isolated system that began in the state of chaos and disorder of an uh, explosion and converted itself into the incredibly complex universe we live in today. This belief is based on an unscientific, irrational faith contrary to natural law. If the Big Bang were true, the planets should all rotate in the same direction on their axis, but Venus and Uranus both rotate backwards. All the nearly 50 moons of the solar system should orbit in their respective planets in the same direction, but at least 11 of them orbit the opposite direction. The sun's inner planets should be made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, like the sun. Much less of 1% of the Earth is made of these elements. The compound laminin is the main element that holds us together. Want to see what laminin looks like? Take a look. Jesus? Who is God? Want more proof? Want to learn more things about this video? Want to see Bible verses? Click on the link below.